You can't spell motorcycle without motor. So let's take a look at a couple different types of motors. In front of me, I've got three different permanent magnet motors that uh, they're similar to the ones that I've used in my motorcycle, but I'll show you there's a bit of differences here too. And then in a minute, I'll also show you a series wound motor as well. So to start off with here, we have a Mars motor, an LMC, and this one is an Agni. As you can see, these two look very, very similar to each other. Uh, the Mars is very similar to the E-Tech that's in my motorcycle. In fact, the guy who originally designed the E-Tech also designed the Mars. Um, so the idea is this is kind of the next generation up from the E-Tech motor. Uh, the brushes are a little bit different and there's a couple other little improvements in here as well. Uh, these are all permanent magnet motors. So each one of these has uh, permanent magnets in the outside, sort of the, the frame of the motor, and then the rotor itself, uh, the armature that has the electromagnet in it. All three are like that. Um, you'll also notice that all three of these have two power connections on them, for example, here and here, and they're all reversible. If you swap the polarity of your power cables to the terminals here, the motor will spin the other direction. Pretty much all of these are designed for uh, either clockwise or counterclockwise uh, uh, power configuration to them. Uh, you will notice the lugs on these are all just a little bit different from each other. This is uh, just traditional threads with uh, brass nuts on there. This one is a little bit more of uh, copper bus bars that stick out that you then put uh, your bolts through and your power lugs. And this one over here, the Agni has a, a pair of smaller power connectors, but again, uh, they're just uh, plain uh, bolt threads and nuts. Now all these motors have some markings on them. Just for example, if we uh, come in close on the, the Mars right here, it tells us the name and where it was manufactured. And then uh, this motor has some nice markings on it as well. Uh, one of them points out the fact that this motor is rated for up to 72 volts. That's good to know. And uh, pretty minimal markings on this one. Um, but typically you can look up all the specs on any of these motors and that'll give you all the information on the voltage, um, how many continuous amps you can put through them, all that kind of technical information that you're looking for. Another really interesting number is right here on this one. It gives you an RPM per volt. And what that does is that allows you to figure out the top speed of your electric motorcycle without ever having the vehicle on the road yet. Uh, for example, if you're going to use a 48 volt battery system with this motor, you could simply multiply 48 times the RPM per volt, which is 52, do the math, and then use that number um, and measure the, the distance around your back tire and the gear ratio, and you can calculate out what your top speed is going to be. Now, I did that on my motorcycle uh, with the the E-Tech motor did a little bit of math and I calculated it out for a 45 mile per hour top speed. Um, and actually, once you do that uh, math, you can figure out a speed per volt uh, based on your gear ratio and, and the tire diameter. And in that case, you can decide, for example, whether you wanted to use a 36, 48 or 72 volt system. Now, another thing is that all three of these motors are very compact. And even though these two look a little bit skinnier, if you actually uh, take a look at them from the side and you measure them, they're really not much smaller um, from the side over that six inches here, about six inches. It's just it looks skinnier because of uh, how this part tapers down and on the Mars motor it doesn't. But they're really uh, pretty all comparable in size and they're about eight, eight and a half inches in diameter. Uh, they have roughly the same horsepower um, and the same range of uh, battery voltages that they're gonna run as well. Uh, let's take a look inside one. Now I'm not gonna completely tear one of these apart, but let's take the end cover off the Mars motor so we can see inside, take a look at how it works. So with the sitting here, I'm just gonna take the screws out. And then when we remove the cover, we'll see the commutator and the brushes. So you can see here, if I rotate the shaft inside, you can see some rotation. Uh, this down here, this is the commutator. 
and then you can see power connections internal to the motor uh, connecting the brushes. The brushes connect to either one of the two. So if we get really in there, the cop those copper bars, that's the commutator, that rotates right along with the drive shaft. I'm just spinning the drive shaft right now. And then here is a spring. And this one's kind of a neat design. I can actually just pop it right out. And that's one of the brushes. It's just a hunk of carbon with a power lead going to it. And then that presses down to conduct power into the commutator and that's held in place by that spring. So with permanent magnet motors, they're very compact, yet they're pretty darn powerful, so they're great for an electric motorcycle project, let uh, take two on that. So these permanent magnet motors here, they're pretty powerful, yet they're very compact, so they're really good for an application like an electric motorcycle. Uh, another thing I'd like to point out is that all three of these face mount, if you look at them from the front, they're gonna have a series of bolt holes and they're designed to bolt directly onto a flat plate uh, to be held into your electric vehicle. Uh, both of these have actually pretty small faces right around the drive shaft, uh, whereas the Mars has a much larger bolt pattern. And on top of that, it also has uh, eight available bolt holes um, instead of just the four. So that gives you a little bit more flexibility on whether you want a smaller or larger uh, bolt pattern, or heck, if you even want to use all eight, eight holes on there. Um, so I think in terms of mounting, uh, that's advantageous there. Now, although in my motorcycle I used a permanent magnet motor, I want to show you another type of motor that can also work well in an electric motorcycle. That's the series wound motor. Let's get that up here. So here we have something a little bit different. This is a series wound motor. Uh, this one actually came out of a Raymond brand forklift. Um, one of the smaller ones that just has a single wheel in the back and that wheel both uh, does the steering and drives the forklift. So this whole motor actually um, sat right on a wheel and the motor rotated with the wheel for doing the steering. Um, I happen to have this in two parts so we can take a look at how it works. And this is an older piece of equipment. It was sitting around in my garage so you can see it's got a little bit of surface rust on it and it's a little bit dirty. But rest assured that um, would not affect its operation if I just cleaned up a little bit of the surface corrosion down here on the commutator and made sure the bearings were good, put this thing back together, it would, uh, it would run like a champ. Uh, what I have in my hands here is the armature. This is the rotor, um, and there's no permanent magnets in this. It's all electromagnets, just like the middle of those permanent magnet motors. But what's different is on this motor, the stator. Instead of having permanent magnets uh, built inside the shell of this, it instead has electromagnets. So we have an electromagnet fighting an electromagnet, whereas before we had an, an electromagnet fighting mineral magnets, permanent magnets, you know, something not unlike uh, refrigerator magnets. You'll also notice that on here, we've got four power connections. Now on the permanent magnets, we only had two, and when we reverse the polarity on those power connectors on the permanent magnet motors, they spin the other way. Now this is a little bit different here. Uh, two of the power connections are for the rotor, and two of them are for the stator. Um, the other thing is that if we reversed the polarity, um, the motor is still going to spin the same direction, because what we're really doing is reversing the polarity of both this magnet and this magnet, and backwards of backwards is still forwards. The way this works is typically you have power connected here and here, and then you have a jumper from here to here. So both the field and the rotor are in series with each other. It's the same current that's going through one also goes through the other. Now, if you wanted to reverse the, uh, the direction of the rotor, instead of having the jumper from here to here, you would do something like power in here, jumper from here to here, power out here. That way we're reversing the magnetic field of just the rotor or the stator, 
not both, and that'll allow us to spin the other direction. Uh, for a motor like this, you could run it either direction. Um, it was designed to make a forklift go both, both forwards and backwards. Um, so for on your motorcycle, if you needed to uh, turn clockwise instead of counterclockwise, um, a motor like this would still allow you to be able to do that. Uh, let's take a look inside. Uh, we'll come in close and take a look inside our stator here. Now what you can see in here, in the very far back middle center, that's where the, uh, the back end of the drive shaft goes. That would have a bearing on that. Um, towards the front, these large oval circles, those are a copper conductor. And by running current around a hunk of iron that's in the middle there, that creates the electromagnetic field. And there's uh, four of these field coils in here. Those are actually all held in with a couple of bolts right up on top here. So those two bolts here, uh, make sure not to pull those out and try to use them for mounting the motor or anything because um, bad things will happen when the inside part here falls off and whacks against the rotor. We definitely do not want that. Uh, also in the back part here, we have the brushes. And I wonder if I can and in the far back here, we have the brushes. Let's take a better look at those. So I just removed the screws that go to the brush leads. We'll move this out of the way. So now in the end of the motor, this is the commutator end. Uh, basically the uh, bearing that holds the, the back end of the drive shaft goes right there in the middle. And then these four brushes come in sort of circularly uh, into the commutator. Uh, here's kind of a fun thing too, with uh, these types of springs, you can use those to hold the brushes out. Typically, that spring is pushing on that brush. So right now, for example, this brush is spring-loaded and it, that spring is always gonna hold that brush against the commutator. But if I pull on that, pull it out, pull the brush up, and then just gently let the spring press against the side, that'll hold it out there, which uh, makes it much easier to put the drive shaft in and out on uh, disassembly and assembly. Now remember, I did say typically um, a lot of these uh, motors you can run either direction, but if you'll notice here, in this case, these brushes are angled, so chances are uh, that on this forklift it was designed to run either direction, but uh, there definitely was a forward direction in mind here. And then also with that end cap off, you get a little bit better view of the insides of the main section here. So you can see how um, it really is just a, uh, a circle of copper around an iron core in four spots around this uh, ring of this motor. So again, a series wound motor has two sets of electromagnets that push against each other to create the rotation, whereas a permanent magnet motor has one electromagnet and one set of permanent magnets that push against each other to create the rotation. Um, a series wound motor has a lot of torque. That's one reason why they're used so often with forklifts. And the other great part is that we've got a zillion forklifts around. So it's pretty easy to go to uh, a lot of junkyards and be able to find a motor like this and basically buy it for scrap metal prices. Um, I've been able to buy these for between $50 and $100 at junkyards. Um, sometimes you can get pretty big motors. But for a motorcycle, we want to find one that's going to be uh, pretty appropriate to fit inside the motorcycle. So even though this motor looks quite a bit bigger than the permanent magnet motors, um, it's only nine and a half inches tall. You know, it's, it's uh, an inch diameter larger than the permanent magnet motors were. Um, it's a little bit wider, but that's not so terrible either because uh, the permanent magnet motors were so skinny that we've still got enough uh, room around those for the motorcycle. So on my project, I decided to use the Briggs & Stratton E-Tech motor. Um, it's a very popular motor. I've seen that it's been used uh, successfully on a lot of other people's electric motorcycle conversions. Uh, if you go to the EV album, you can sort not just by uh, make and model a vehicle, but also the parts that are in it, whether it's the controller or the batteries or the motor. So if you do a search by type of motor, um, you'll see the E-Tech listed on uh, quite a few electric motorcycles. 
Uh, the E-Tex rated for uh, 150 amps continuous. I knew that'd be more than enough. And it's also rated for up to 48 volts. And I knew I wasn't gonna be able to put more than four batteries into this motorcycle. Uh, it also matches up nicely with a, 40, uh, a 48 volt 300 amp controller, which is kind of one of those price points. You know, it, um, going up to the 72 volt controllers uh, starts getting expensive quick, but if you stay with 48 volts and not too high of amperage, uh, the components stay uh, pretty reasonably priced. Uh, so those were all factors when I was considering which motor to use in my motorcycle. So now that we've got a motor picked out, we're going to have to figure out how to attach it to the motorcycle itself. And that's where we need to design a motor adapter plate.